Morning class. So today we're going to go over chapter 21, toxicology. Introduction. Every day we come into contact with things that are potentially poisonous. Acute poisoning affects 2 million people each year. Chronic poisoning is more common. Deaths in adults have been rising as a result of drug abuse. Identifying the patient in the poison. Toxicology is a study of the toxic or poisonous substances. Poison, any substance whose chemical action can damage body structures or impair body function. Toxin, a poisonous substance produced by bacteria, animals, or plants. Substance abuse is a misuse of any substance to produce a desired effect. Overdose, a toxic dose of a drug. So here are your different uh, your agents. You have your opioids, opioids, uh, symp sympathomimetics, uh, sedative, anticholinergics, excuse me, and then your signs and symptoms of each each drug that you would expect to see. So we talked about opioids, opiates as well. Um, what we use Narcan for and what it does to the body. Uh, it can result in respiratory arrest. We only really use Narcan to um, help the patient breathe better. Okay, so pinpoint pupils as well. So if possible, ask the patient, what did you take? When did you take it? Or become exposed to it? How much did you ingest? Did you have anything to eat or drink before or after you took it? Has an antidote been given since ingestion? How much do you weigh? So try to determine the nature of the poison. Look around the immediate area for clues. Take any suspicious material with you. Containers at the scene can provide critical information. Examine vomit for pill fragments. Note and document anything unusual that you see. So if, you are, if you're able to find the containers at the scene, uh, always take them with you, no matter what it is. Um, for the most part, any pill bottles, any liquids, any um, anything that they may have ingested for the doctor to see and another good resource for you guys to have is poison control poison control is a good number to call uh, in case you have somebody who overdose on anything that you're not exactly sure uh, what kind of substance it is so how poisons enter the body treatment depends on how the poison got into the patient's body four routes to consider Inhalation, absorption, ingestion, and injection. So here you have inhalation, absorption, gets on the patient's skin. And you see somebody using a sponge to kind of wipe the substance off, whatever it is. Ingestion, pills, or injection. So inhaled poisons, move the patient in fresh air immediately. The patient may require supplemental oxygen. If you suspect the presence of a toxic gas, call for the hazmat team. All patients who have inhaled poison require immediate transport. Some patients use inhaled poisons to commit suicide in a vehicle. Exhaust fumes contain high levels of carbon monoxide. Chemicals or detergents in a tightly sealed vehicle create a type of gas chamber. When you open the door, you may become overwhelmed as well. Contact hazardous materials responders and have them remove the victim so you want to stage uphill and upwind uh, for anything deemed hazardous or unknown substance you don't want to go in any area any residence uh, warehouse that may have a hazardous materials <laughs> absorbed in surface contact poisons can affect the patient in many ways skin mucous membrane or eye damage chemical burns rashes Systemic effects, distinguish between contact burns and contact absorption. So signs and symptoms include a history of exposure, liquid or powder on the patient's skin, burns, itching, irritation, redness of skin, odors of the substance. Emergency treatment, avoid contaminating yourself or others, remove the substance as rapidly as possible. Remove all contaminated clothing, flush and wash the skin. If dry powder has spilled, brush off and float, flood with water for 15 to 20 minutes, then wash with soap and water. If liquid has spilled, flood for 15 to 20 minutes. This also applies to eyes. 
if you guys get anything in your eyes, uh, you want to flush out your eye for as long as you can. So if a chemical agent has been introduced to the eyes, irrigate them quickly and thoroughly. So this is actually a very good way to help flood the eyes. Grab a nasal cannula and attach it to a saline bag and just let it flow wide open. That way the two little prongs that go in your nose, you just flip them upside down and hold the patient's eyes and just let the water run through it. And that'll probably take for the whole bag maybe about 15 to 20 minutes. But also make sure that you guys are that that uh, chemicals not going on yourself like on your pants or anything else like that or your hands because then it could be absorbed and it could contaminate you as well. So in an industrial setting, safety showers and specific protocols may be available. Hazmat teams should be available to assist you and ensure that you or your team and the patient are thoroughly decontaminated, de obtain material safety data sheets. So for every, um, every hospital has a shower right outside the ER. And that's a good place for you guys to shower down your patient if something may have happened with them. Do not ever bring somebody who's contaminated in the back of your ambulance or to the ER because you're going to contaminate everyone inside your ambulance and you're going to contaminate everyone inside the ER. Doctors aren't going to be very happy with you if you do that. And you also got to let the hospital know beforehand what the patient was exposed to. <laughs> so ingest the poisons. About 80% of poisoning is by mouth, usually accidental in children and deliberate in adults. Signs and symptoms will vary with type of poison, age of the patient, time that has passed since ingestion. So signs and symptoms may include burns around the mouth, gastrointestinal pain, vomiting, cardiac dysrhythmias, or seizures. Treat signs and symptoms and notify the poison center and medical control. Consider if there is an unabsorbed poison in the gastrointestinal tract and whether you can safely prevent its absorption. Some EMS systems allow EMTs to administer activated charcoal. So we've gone over this. So activated charcoal is an adsorbent. So it says right here on the thing, poison adsorbent. So for anybody who's taken any type, type of pills within the past hour, you could all give this to them. This is exactly what we carry. So we cut off the cap right here and tell the patient to drink it. It's only used for pills, not for any liquids acids or alkalis. Exposure by injection includes intravenous drug abuse and envenomation by insects, arachnids, and reptiles. Usually absorbed quickly into the body, cannot be diluted or re removed from the body in the field. Signs and symptoms may include weakness, dizziness, fever, chills, unresponsiveness, and excitability. Monitor the airway. Provide high flow oxygen. Be alert for nausea and vomiting. And transport promptly. Remove rings, watches, and bracelets from areas around the injection site if swelling occurs. So scene size up. Take standard precautions and look for clues that indicate the substance involved. Is there an odor in the room? Is the scene safe? Are there medication bottles lying around? Is there medication missing to indicate an overdose? Are alcoholic beverages, beverage containers present? Are there syringes or other drug paraphernalia? Is there a suspicious odor that may indicate the presence of a drug laboratory? Primary assessment. Determine the severity of the patient's condition. Obtain a general impression. Assess the level of consciousness. Determine any life threats. Do not assume a conscious, alert, and oriented patient is stable. So airway and breathing. Ensure an open airway and adequate ventilation. Patient has difficulty breathing, begin oxygen therapy. Have suction available. Circulation, assess the pulse and skin condition. So transport decision, consider prompt transport for patients with obvious alterations in the ABCs. 
or for patients you have determined to have a poor general impression, everyone who is exposed to the hazardous material must be thoroughly decontaminated before leaving the scene. So we talked about this a couple slides ago. Everyone needs to be decontaminated before leaving the scene. Before getting in the back of your ambulance, patients need to be decontaminated. That possibly means stripping off all their clothes, having them uh, shower. If it's, a, if it's a big incident, there's going to be some first responders or hazardous material responders that are going to have showers and decon areas set up, and patients are going to have to go through that before they even get transported to the hospital. And the hospital is going to be aware of what possibly the the hazardous material uh, the patient was exposed to. So history taking. Investigate the chief complaint. If your patient is responsive, begin with an evaluation of the exposure and the sample history. If your patient is unresponsive, attempt to obtain the history from other sources. So is anybody else there on scene? Any family? Any friends? Any co-workers? Anybody that might know the patient, try and figure out what they were they were exposed to. Bring everything that you can with you to the hospital. <laughs> Ask the following questions. What is the substance involved? When was the patient exposed? What was the level of exposure? How does the patient or bystander perform any intervention? How much does the patient weigh? So this is also a good one too because any medications that the doctors or the facility might give the patient might be weight based. So it's a good idea to ask the patient or any bystanders if they know how much the patient weighs. <laughs> so physical examinations. Focus on the area of the body involved with the poisoning or the route of exposure. A general review of all body systems may help to identify systemic problems. A complete set of baseline vital signs is important. Look for alterations in the LOC, pulse, respirations, blood pressure, and skin. Reassess the adequacy of the ABCs. Remember, reassessing every five minutes for unstable patients and every 15 minutes for stable patients. Repeat vital signs. Compare them with the baseline set. So what is a baseline set of vital signs? Baseline set is your very first set of vital signs. And this is why we repeat them to make sure the patient's still stable or is improving or is deteriorating. Evaluate your interventions every 15 minutes for a stable patient, every five minutes or constantly for a patient who has consumed a harmful or lethal dose. So communication documentation. Report as much information as you have about the poison or chemical to the hospital. Bring or have the company fax the material data sheet to the hospital if the poisoning occurred in a work setting. So emergency medical care, ensure scene safety. Follow standard precautions, perform external decontamination, remove tablets or fragments from the patient's mouth, wash or brush the poison from the patient's skin. Assess and maintain the patient's ABCs, treat for shock and transport the patient promptly to the nearest hospital. Some EMS systems allow EMTs to give activated charcoal by mouth. So remember, that's one of the drugs you guys have to know. Your indications, your contraindications, the route, the dose, what kind of drug it is, what, what class it's in. So activated charcoal binds to specific toxins, which are then carried out of the body, not indicated for patients who have ingested alkali poisons, cyanide, ethanol, iron, lithium, methanol, mineral acids, organic solvents or who have a decreased LOC and cannot protect their airway. You will likely carry plastic bottles of premixed suspension, each containing up to 50 grams of activated charcoal. And these are some of the name brands for it. Instachar, Act, Actidose, Liquid Char, the usual dose for an adult or child is one gram per kilo of body weight. Obtain approval for medical control, either online or offline. Shake the, bo the bottle vigorously. Record the time charcoal is administered. If the patient refuses to activate charcoal, document the refusal and transport the patient for further evaluation. So make sure any time a patient refuses medication, if they're alert and oriented times four, 
they could refuse medication. But you also want to document that to cover yourself and let the hospital and the facility know that patient's refusing medication right now. So side effects of activated charcoal are constipation and black stools. The patient has ingested a poison, caused nausea, he or, may sh he or she may vomit after taking charcoal. Specific poisons. Over time, a person may need increasing amounts of a substance to achieve the same result. Developing the tolerance, safety awareness, and standard precautions cannot be overemphasized. Known drug abusers have a fairly high incidence of serious and undiagnosed infections, including HIV and hepatitis. So alcohol. Alcohol can damage the liver, whether through chronic overuse or occasional heavy use or binge drinking. Binge use can be more damaging than chronic use. Alcohol is a powerful CNS depressant or central nervous suppressant. Decreases activity and excitement, induces sleep, dulls the sense of awareness, slows reflexes, and reduces reaction time. May cause aggressive and inappropriate behavior and lack of coordination. Alcohol increases the effects of other drugs and is commonly taken with other substances. If a patient exhibits signs of a serious CNS depression, you must provide respiratory support, may cause vomiting. Patients may experience frightening hallucinations or delirium tremens, or DTS. Delirium tremens are char characterized by agitation and restlessness, fever, sweating, tremors, confusion, disorientation, delusions, hallucinations, and seizures. So opioids. So these are some of the common opioids and opiates that either legal or, or illegal that you guys might get prescribed. If you guys ever broken a foot or broken broken a knee or injured yourself, um, doctors might prescribe some of this stuff for you. You might get codeine. You might get hydrocodeine, hydromorphine, or dilated morphine, or oxycontin. An opioid is a type of narcotic medication used to relieve pain. An opioid is a subset of the opioid family and refers to natural, non-synthetic opioids. So opioid dependency can occur after taking a medical prescription. Opioids are CNS depressants and can cause severe respiratory depression. Tolerance develops quickly, often causes nausea and vomiting, may lead to hypotension. Patients typically appear unconscious and cyanotic with pinpoint pupils. So naloxone reverses effects of opioid or opioid overdose. Can be given intravenously, intramuscular, intranasally. And many EMS systems, EMTs, administer naloxone by the intranasal route. Find out if, from the bystanders if the patient was given naloxone prior to the EMS arrival. So... So for people who need naloxone or have either respiratory distress or are breathing shallow, shallowly or inadequately, the dose for Narcan is 0 0.4 to 2 milligrams. I don't think you guys have a limit on how much you can give. Uh, you'd have to look in your book to just double check. Um, but it's been given the intranasally route. So if you're going to give a patient 2 milligrams, you're going to give 1 milligram in each nostril. You're going to push fast. Make sure that uh, medication mystifies uh, when you put that little nasal thing on your, your syringe. Sedative hypnotic drugs, barbiturates and benzodiazepines are easy to obtain and relatively cheap. CNS depressants can alter the level of consciousness. The patient may appear drowsy, peaceful, or intoxicated. These agents are te generally taken by mouth. Occasionally, the capsules are suspended or dissolved in water and injected. IV sedative hypnotic drugs quickly induce tolerance. These drugs may be given to people as a knockout drink. Your treatment is to ensure airways patent, assist ventilation, and provide prompt transport. <laughs> Abuse inhalates. Inhalants. These agents are inhaled. Acetone, toluene, xylene, hexane, found in glues, cleaning compounds, paint thinners, and lacquers. 
gasoline halogenated hydrocarbons are also abused. Commonly abused by teenagers. Halogenated hydrocarbon solvents can make the heart hypersensitive to the patient's own adrenaline. Even the action of walking may cause a fatal ventricular dysrhythmia. Use a stretcher to move the patients, give oxygen and transport to the hospital. Hydrogen sulfide, a highly toxic, colorless, and flammable gas with distinctive rotten egg odor. Affects all organs, but it has the most impact on the lungs and CNS. Used to commit suicide. If you suspect the presence of a toxic gas, wait for a hazmat team to tell you the scene is safe. So signs and symptoms, nausea and vomiting, confusion, dyspnea, and a loss of consciousness, seizures, shock, coma, and cardiopulmonary arrest. Once the patient has been decontaminated, management is largely supportive. Monitor and assist the patient's respiratory and cardiovascular functions. Provide rapid transport. So sympathomimetics. CNS stimulants that mimic the effects of the sympath sympathetic fight or flight nervous system. So these are some some drugs that increase the sympathomimetic or flight or flight nervous system. What's a drug that we give that increases the sympathomimetic? effects on the body for us we give her allergic reaction we give epinephrine so a stimulant is an agent that produces an excited state frequently caused hypertension tachycardia and dilated pupils cocaine may be taken in a number of different ways it can be absorbed through all mucous membranes and even across the skin Media effects include excitement and euphoria and last less than an hour. Acute overdose is a genuine emergency. Patients have a high risk of seizures, cardiac dysrhythmias, and stroke. Patients may experience hallucinations or paranoia. Do not leave the patient unattended. Provide prompt transport. So bath salts. This is getting real popular on the East Coast. An emergent class of drugs similar to MDMA sold as bath salts to escape the legal restrictions imposed on illicit drugs. Cathinones produce euphoria, increased mental clarity, and sexual arousal. Most users of this drug snort or insufflate the powder nasally. Effects reportedly last as long as 48 hours. Adverse effects include teeth grinding, appetite lice, appetite, excuse me, appetite loss, Muscle twitching, lip smacking, confusion, gastrointestinal conditions, paranoid, headache, elevated heart rate, and hallucinations. Keep the patient calm in transport. Consider ALS assistance. Some of these patients may require chemical restraint to facilitate safe transport. Marijuana is abused throughout the world. THC is a chemical in the marijuana plant that produces is high, produces euphoria, relaxation, and drowsiness impair short-term memory, and the capacity to do complex thinking. Could, pre could progress to depression and confusion. High doses may cause hallucinations, anxiety, or paranoia. Marijuana may be used as a vehicle to get other drugs into the body. Several states have legalized the recreational use of marijuana, and others allow for the medical use of products that contain THC. Edibles are infused with marijuana. Ingestion of marijuana can lead to cannab cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. So it's like excessive throwing up. <coughs> Excuse me. Synthetic marijuana or spice refers to a variety of herbal incense or smoking blends that resemble THC and produce a similar high. Powerful and unpredictable effects may result ranging from simple euphoria to complete loss of consciousness. So this is another one that's getting popular on the East Coast as well. Spice and bath salts. Because it's hard to test for some of these uh, products. Because they don't come up in your normal drug screen. And that's why it's getting popular. So hallucinogens. 
Hallucinogens alter a person's sensory perception. Classic example is LSD. And here's a couple commonly abused hallucinogens. So these agents cause visual hallucinations, intensify vision and hearing, generally separate the user from reality. Patients experiencing a bad trip have hypertension, tachycardia, anxiety, and paranoia. Use a calm, professional manner. Provide emotional support. Do not use restraints unless you or the patient is in danger of injury. Watch the patient carefully throughout transport and do not leave unintended. Request ALS assistance when appropriate. So anticholinergic, uh, excuse me, agents, medications that block the parasympathetic nerves. Hot as a hair, blind as a bat, dry as a bone, red as a beet, and mad as a hatter. Include atropine, Benadryl, Jimson weed, and amitriptyline. Patient can go from normal to seizure and death within 30 minutes. Cholinergic agents. These agents overstimulate normal body functions that are controlled by the parasympathetic nerves. Include nerve gases designed for chemical warfare and organophosphate insecticides. Use a mnemonic dumbbells to remember the signs and symptoms. So diarrhea, urination, meiosis, bradycardia, bronchospasm, bronchorrhea, emesis, lacrimation, seizures, salivating, sweating. Or you could use sludgem, salivation, sweating, lacrimation, urination, defecation, drooling, diarrhea, gastric upset and cramps, emesis, muscle twitching. So the most important consideration is to avoid exposure yourself. Decontamination may take priority over immediate transport. Hazmat team will provide decontamination and contain the exposure chemical. After decontamination, decrease secretions in mouth and trachea. Provide airway support. So that's what I was talking about. You guys might have to, you guys are probably going to have stage in what we call the cold zone. Um, there's going to be a hot zone, there's going to be a warm zone, and also a cold zone. So where the, the hazmat or exposure chemical is going to be is going to be exactly in the hot zone. The hazmat team is going to go in and bring somebody out, and they're going to bring them to the warm zone. The warm zone is where they get de decontaminated at. Um, and anything past the, the cold zone is going to be, everyone's going to be decontaminated. They're going to be safe, safe to transport. You guys will learn about that a little bit later, I think, uh, the last few chapters of your book. So, antidote kit may be available, duodote auto-injector. The kit consists of a single auto-injector containing atropine and uh, pralidoxum. If a known exposure to nerve agents with manifestation of signs and symptoms has occurred, use the antidote kit on yourself. So, miscellaneous drugs. Um, examples of fatally ingested poisons. You guys have all your um, poisons over here, just a few of them. So overdose with cardiac medications has become common. Signs and symptoms depend on medication ingested. Contact the poison center. Aspirin poisoning remains a potentially lethal condition. Ingesting too many aspirin may result in nausea, vomiting, hypertension, and ringing in the ears. Patients may have anxiety, confusion, Tachnipia and hyperthermia or maybe in danger of having seizures. Overdose with acetaminophen is also very common, must be treated promptly and aggressively. Some alcohols, including methyl alcohol and ethanol glycol, are even more toxic than ethyl alcohol or drinking alcohol, and cause severe tachnipia, blindness, renal failure, and eventual death. So, food poisoning. Almost always caused by eating food contaminated by bacteria. Organism itself may cause disease. Organism may produce toxins that cause disease. I'm sure some of you guys have had at least food poisoning once in your life before. Not a good feeling. Uh, it's usually vomiting, uh, diarrhea, and cramps for the most part. Salmonella bacterium causes salmonellus. 
uh, characterized by severe GI symptoms within 72 hours of ingestion, including nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. Proper cooking kills bacteria and proper cleanliness in the kitchen prevents the contamination of uncooked foods. A more common cause of food poisoning is the ingestion of powerful toxins produced by bacteria, often left in, often in leftovers. The bacterium Staphylococcus is quick to grow and produce toxins in food. Foods left on refrigerator are a common vehicle. So this is why we don't leave foods out. The most severe form of toxin ingestion is botulism. It can result from eating improperly canned food. Symptoms are neurologic, blurring of vision, weakness, difficulty in speaking and breathing. Do not try to determine the specific cause of acute GI problems. Gather as much history as possible from the patient. Transport promptly. When two or more persons have the same illness, take along the suspected food. So if somebody tells you they think they have food poisoning, a good, good question to ask too is, has anybody else eaten with you or what did you eat? Um, and see if they got the same symptoms as you. So plant poisoning. Many household plants are poisonous and ingested. Assess airway and vital signs. Notify the poison center. Take the plant to the emergency department. So which of the following questions is of least pertinence for the EMT to ask a patient who intentionally overdosed on a medication? So D, determining what the patient ingested, how much was ingested in the patient's weight are all pertinent and have a direct impact on the care that is provided during the acute phase. Why the patient ingested the medication does not have a direct impact on acute care. Therefore, it is the least per pertinent question to ask. So how much do you weigh? Um, it's going to tell you a lot about what kind of treatment that the patient might get or what kind of drugs they might get at the hospital. And then how much did you ingest? If you got a, a bottle that holds 100 Tylenol and there's only 10 left, it's probably a good question to ask. How much did you ingest? And then what substance did you take? Or how many substances did you take? Sometimes people take multiple substances at the same time, so you got to carry multiple pill bottles with you. And why did you take the medications? can be your least important question to ask. They'll probably ask that at the hospital or if PD's on scene. PD's going to ask why you took the medication and probably put the patient on a hold. So a 30-year-old man who ingested an unknown substance begins to vomit. You should... So A, if the patient vomits, examine the contents for pill fragments. Ensure that you are wearing proper PPE for this activity. Note and document anything unusual that you see. You should try to collect the vomitus in a separate plastic bag so that it can be analyzed at the hospital. So when caring for a patient with surface contact poisoning, it's important to remember to... So B, emergency care for a patient with a surface contact poisoning includes avoiding comp contaminating yourself and others and removing the irritating and corrosive substance from the patient as rapidly as possible. Dry chemicals may be brushed from the body prior to flushing with water. So remember, scene safety, always want to protect yourself and your patient, or excuse me, yourself, your partner, and your patient. Make sure you're not exposed. Make sure you don't become a patient. So most poisonings occur via the which route? So B, approximately 80% of all poisonings occur by ingestion. So 
So how much activated charcoal should you administer to a 55 pound child who swallowed a bottle of aspirin? So what's the, first you guys need to know the dose of activated charcoal. It's gonna be one gram per kilo, right? So how do you go from kilos to pounds or vice versa? So B, the usual dose of activated charcoal for adults and children is one gram of charcoal per kilo of body weight. To convert patients' weight from pounds to kilograms, simply divide the weight in pounds by 2.2. Therefore, a 55-pound child should receive 25 grams of activated charcoal. 55 pounds divided by 2.2 equals 25 kilograms. The average pediatric dosing range for activated charcoal is 12.5 to 25 grams. So remember that. So from pounds to kilos, you've got to divide the weight by 2.2. Or divide it in half if you if you guys can right off the top of your head so 180 pound patient you're probably gonna give around 90 uh, kilo or patients gonna weigh about 90 kilograms so they should get about 90 grams of activated charcoal depending on what your protocol is so after taking Vicodin for two years for chronic pain a 40 year old woman Finds that her usual dosage is no longer effective and goes to the doctor to request a higher dosage. This is an example of So after somebody takes any kind of substance for a long time, they eventually build up a C, a tolerance. A person who takes a medication for a prolonged period of time often finds that higher doses of medication are required to achieve the same effect. This is called tolerance. So which of the following effects does drinking alcohol not produce? How does alcohol work on the body? What does it affect? What are the side effects of alcohol? It's a CNS depressant. So it's probably not going to increase your sense of awareness. So D, drinking alcohol is both a sed sedative and hypnotic. Uh, it dulls the sense of awareness, slows reflexes, and reduces reaction time. It may also cause aggressive or inappropriate behavior and lack of coordination. So a 21-year-old male was found unconscious in an alley. Your initial assessment reveals that his respirations are slow and shallow and his pulse is slow and weak. Further assessment reveals that his pupils are bilaterally constricted. His presentation is most consistent with the overdose of... So look at... All these drugs, what classes are they going to be in? How do they affect the body? So the answer is going to be B. Opioids are central nervous system depressant drugs. When taken in excess, they cause respiratory depression, bradycardia, and hypotension. Another common sign is meiosis, constricted or pinpoint pupils. Cocaine stimulant drugs, uppers, and methamphetamine have the opposite effect. They stimulate the central nervous system, cause tachycardia and hypertension. So the mnemonic dumbbells can be used to recall the signs and symptoms of the colon cholinergic drug poisoning. The E in dumbbell stands for So A, the mnemonic dumbbells can help you recall the signs and symptoms of cholinergic drug poisoning, i.e. organophosphates. Stands for excessive defecation, urination, meiosis, pupillary constriction, bronchorrhea, emesis, lacrimation, and salivation. So food poisoning is almost always caused by eating food that contains... So 
So C, food poisoning is almost always caused by eating foods that contain bacteria. Salmonella poisoning botulism, two common forms of food poisoning, are both caused by bacteria.